Good morning, church. Praise the Lord. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed today. We dare not forget that. Um, this is one of the most significant and powerful realities that we live in today um, as believers. And uh, thank you for organizing for the children to be part of the service and for them to rejoice and, and to sing for their king, for he is indeed their king as well. Um, we take seriously these things because that's how we pass on the faith baton to them. And uh, Jesus says, you know, do not hinder the children uh, from coming to me because the kingdom of God belongs to such as this. So they are already part of the kingdom. And uh, as we assimilate them and, and help them see how big church is done, um, they were very confident on the mic. Did you notice? Yeah, um, that's, that's a beautiful thing. We need to give them every opportunity to serve God and to love him and to belong to this community of faith. Um, make it impossible for them not to know Christ uh, in everything that we do. That was the essence of the teaching uh, right from the beginning, the Old Testament. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 8, chapter 6, um, and most of them are saying, you know, the Lord will tell them these things you are to teach to your children. Teach it to them when you're seated down, when you're standing up, when you're walking along the road. Immerse them in the realities and the truths of God for every opportunity so that what we do here is continued in your homes and um, every single day of their lives, they can know of the goodness of God. Amen? Our visitors, thank you for choosing to come to Mamlaka Hill Chapel. We pray that uh, you... You will have a good time here of fellowship with brothers and sisters um, from this part of the world. Uh, and indeed, do take your, our greetings back to your churches and to your loved ones and tell them that we love Jesus here as much as you do. We're going to stick with the Abraham conversations. And uh, we say that we're trying to look at some of the things that were prefigured ahead of time by God, because we are not in a random place somewhere. Uh, this story is going somewhere. And God is the master script writer, and he has designed it such that he is taking us to a culmination, a destination somewhere, and it will not fail because God does not fail. So everything that we read and see, we can see the design of the redemption story being written in every page uh, of scripture as we are advancing towards the climatic uh, time, which is this weekend that we celebrate, the Easter weekend of the resurrection uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the story goes on. But now uh, for a flashback of what had been prefigured in chapter 22 of the book of Genesis. We talked about Abraham last week and, and the promise that he had been given by God and the fulfillment of the same, uh, that at a very elderly age, against all odds, um, Sarah had conceived, the, the promise of God had been fulfilled, and now elderly Sarah is holding a baby boy, by the name of Isaac. Um, we said Isaac means he laughs because the very promise was laughable. And when Abraham heard it for the first time, he just laughed and said, you know, at 100 years old, will I really, really get, you know, get a son? And will my wife at 90 have the pleasure of conceiving and giving birth? And God had said, is anything too hard for the Lord? And at the appointed time, God came and fulfilled his promise. Now Abraham will go to a whole different zone with God. At this point, he's already in covenant relationship with him. And he's been given the sign of the covenant, the sign of circumcision uh, for all the males under his house. He obeyed it at a, the age of 100. The Bible records that he and Ishmael were, you know, circumcised on the same day. And they became covenant people. Um, and so God was going to walk with them and, and fulfill for them the promise. God is now going to test Abraham severely, and he will test him as a parent. And every parent would be, can be able to understand some of the emotions that uh, must be tied up to this story. 
because the parent is completely um, committed to the welfare of the child. And so anything that suggests that the child can be harmed um, or put in jeopardy, that thing we will tend to reject because as parents, we are wired to protect, to nurture, to provide, uh, to guide our children because we want them to outlive us. Um, we want them to prosper. We want them to achieve more than what we have achieved. So when God makes this request, we can understand that you know, the emotions of it must be very difficult for Abraham. In chapter 22, we read that sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and it's nice when you read a story when you already know how the story goes. It's quite different if you're the one on test because you don't know how the story ends. For you, this is breaking news and you are walking in uncharted territory. And this is one thing that we said we need to appreciate about Abraham. There is nothing about him and his relationship with God that has precedence. God just came and called him and said, come to a place I will show you. He obeyed God and he walked. He had no body of evidence to suggest that this God works in this particular way or he blesses those who obey him. He, he did not have that evidence. He came from Mesopotamia, so, you know, where they, 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 they worshipped idols. So he has no real reason to heed God's calling. He has no real reason to obey God. He has no re real reason to believe God, for that matter. In later days, people would believe God because there was a record of evidence of what God had done for his people. Uh, we believe God because even around us, there are testimonies of what God has done. Not so for Abraham. God calls him. He's going to test him severely. And in this test, there is no knowing how the results will pan out because it's not been done before. And so I think with that in mind, we can appreciate the difficulty that Abraham is going to be facing. And not just that, but the kind of man who he really was. Here I am, he replied. Then God said to him, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Okay? And so God is touching at a very delicate place in Abraham's life. Because the promises that Abraham had been given were to be reckoned through Isaac. So you touch Isaac and you mess up with the future. So when God suggests take Abraham, uh, uh, Isaac, um, your only son. He's being very specific about which son. The one that you love. So God is in touch with the emotions of Abraham and how he feels about his son. Then he says this, very unlikely words, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. Right there, you expect Abraham to like say, whoa, God, you know, chill out. This is my son. And you're right, my only son, whom I love. And am I going to offer him as a sacrifice? So, even in terms of God's own self-revelation at this point, Abraham is starting to figure out what kind of a God is this and what kinds of demands is he making of me. God has made a covenant with Abraham and he's told him, I'll bless you, I'll make you a father of many nations, etc., etc." It hasn't happened yet. In fact, the promise of making him many nations has only come in form of one child. And that doesn't look exactly like, you know, it's a, it's a great multiplier. Just one. So again, Abraham is a very curious man. Because in verse 3, it says, early the next morning. Remember, when we were looking at uh, Abraham again last week and at the weeks before, we said the, he's, he's just a guy who's very responsive to God. There's instant obedience. At 100 years, you know, he takes the very day that God talks to him, he takes all the male children, including himself, and circumcises them. Doesn't understand the covenant, doesn't understand the mechanics of it. They don't seem to matter. God said so, I'll do it. That seems to be his, the, the, the natural leaning and posture of his heart. So here, this is a ridiculous ask. But early the following morning, he's up and he's going to do it. 
Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood, now by this time he knows what a burnt sacrifice is and how much wood it takes. Eh? So he cuts enough. So you, you can already see that his heart is actually bent on implementation. Well, if you ask me, I'll take very little wood myself. You know, I'm just saying. Uh, and, and one that will burn quickly. You know, before I said, now God, you see, I tried. You know, this, the, the, wood just, the wood just didn't take. Or, or some of you would take wet wood, you know. Why? Because your instinct would be to preserve that which is precious to you. And we know how precious our children are to us. Especially when it's an only child, especially when it's a child of promise, especially when it's a child born in old age. We know that later on about Jacob and, and, and how um, attached he was to Joseph. Later on, when he thought that Joseph had died, he was very attached to Benjamin. And, and at one point when Benjamin was, uh, you know, going to be left in Egypt, one of the brothers, Judah, said, look, you know, you take me instead. Because if this kid doesn't return, the life of our father is tied up with his life. And the old man will come to ruin. He will die. And yet, he had many sons, you know. Uh, but it doesn't matter. So, him he cuts enough wood for the burnt offering. He set out to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place at a distance. Just for your information, the region of Moriah is the same place where God in, in, in years to come would instruct that his temple be built. In the region of Mount Moriah. And it is the same place where another son, you know, would ascend and go and be nailed on a cross. And we say this God is prefiguring ahead of time what must soon take place. And he's doing this to Abr Abram, first called Abram, the exalted father, who has only one son, later to become the father of many nations. And that on this mountain, a precious and very, very costly sacrifice which we celebrate in Easter is going to be given or offered to God. So he looks at it and it's at a distance. Then he instructs his servants, you stay here. To Abraham, it's very interesting. He t tells the servants, you stay here with the donkey. Well, I and the boy go over there. We will worship. And then we will come back to you. Obviously, this must be a prophetic utterance. Uh, first of all, the way he captures the idea, the boy and I, it's a very private affair. This is between God and I. The servants and everything else will be left there. We will ascend to the mountain with the boy. We will go there and worship. So his whole idea about sacrificing Isaac and offering a burnt offering, he understands it clearly as an act of worship to God. A very costly act of worship to God. And then probably speaking prophetically, then he says, then we will come back to you. Ordinarily, when you offer a sacrifice, you're not supposed to, I mean, at least one of you is not making it back. Because a burnt offering is going to be burnt whole completely into ashes. That was the requirement of a burnt offering. But most likely, speaking prophetically, saying, we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. Again, figuratively, uh, he has the instruments of inflicting um, the penalty <laughs> that is going to be inflicted, fire uh, plus a knife. The boy carries the firewood. Interesting. Another son in years to come would carry the instrument of his own punishment, carry a cross to a place called Golgotha, uh, as those who were going to nail him on the cross walked with him. A prefiguring of the, another sacrifice that would be, be made in years to come. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, 
Isaac said, but there is, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Here, we can already start to note that the boy is old enough to put two and two together, to hold a conversation and to look at the logic of what they are going to do. So he's not really that young. He's probably eight, I don't know, um, but, but old enough to carry all that firewood by himself up the hill, wherever they're they are going, or to the place of offering, but also to have a logical conversation and see that the instruments of sacrifice are here, but there's something missing. The lamb of burnt offering is not here. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together, I would imagine, quietly. The Lord himself will provide the lamb for burnt offering. Again, we catch the sentiments of the father. He knows the son is a sacrifice, but who can bring himself, or who, which father has the courage to tell the son that, you know, this is where your life is going to end? And by my hand, that's a very difficult conversation. One can only imagine what that three-day journey looked like, how heavy it was on Abraham as he carried um, the thoughts and the knowledge of the consequences of what is going to happen. Uh, he must have thought, what, what am I going to tell Sarah, you know, when I come back alone, if indeed I'm going to, to, to sacrifice the son. And he was determined to obey God. One can only capture some of the sentiments and the heaviness of his heart. And even his reply, you know, um, wanting to shelter the son from the reality of the cruel death that is about to happen to him. Sometimes God wants us to feel a little bit of the burden that he has for us um, as he shepherds us as his children. The pain that he has of losing some of us who rebel against him and refuse to conform to his ways. When he gives clear instructions and tells us, do such and such and do such and such so that it may go well with you. Because he's a parent. He understands. Every parent, including the parent who disciplines their, ch their children, and I hope you discipline yours, uh, because you want it to go well with them. The idea behind discipline is not to inflict pain, is not to punish, is to guide. In fact, it is protective. Everything that you do for your children, you're doing it so that in the end, it may go well with them. And every parent, at one stage, once, once your child has succeeded and even um, done better than you, you know, you're full of pride and you're, you're happy that it turned out well for them. You celebrate them. And God wants us to catch some of these sentiments as a father. Here, he allows Abraham to bear the burden of the consequences of losing a son, knowing fully well how much he loves that son and what is exactly at stake. And you can imagine uh, the, the turmoil that, that Abraham was going through at this point. And he shares a little bit of what the Heavenly Father will go through in years to come. When the Heavenly Father would give up his son, his only son, so that we ourselves can have life. Um, he became sin for us. He did not sin, but he became sin for us. All our sins were taken and loaded up on him. And, and it was so real that God completely turned away from his own son. Because when he looked at him, he saw our sins on him. And he cut him off from fellowship. And Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken for real. So that we may be accepted. And so Abraham, in a sense, is prefiguring this, just carrying the weight of sacrificing an innocent son because God had said so. When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his heart and took his knife to slay his son. 
So, so this is a, a curious text. Again, when you think about Isaac and how old he must be at this time, the fact that he can already figure out there's something more going. The, this story doesn't quite add up. He knows it. He can't see the lamb of burnt offering. And by the time they reach up there and, 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 and he offloads that wood and the father begins to arrange it, there's still no lamb. Then the father takes him and binds him to the altar. What's very odd about it is that apart from the few words recorded, Father, yes, I see the fire, I see the wood, but where is the lamb for burnt offering? Those are the only words recorded that Isaac speaks. He doesn't speak anything else. By the time he's being captured, bound, and laid on the altar, you would expect of a boy who is around nine or ten or eight, whatever, who has figured out that he is now the lamb for burnt uh, offering, there would be protests, there would be screaming, there would be, I mean, the kid would have taken off, really. He's a boy. And, 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 and Abraham, what is he going to do? He's a hundred years old. He can't catch up. But this kid doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. It's a little odd, don't you think? He has a, a peculiar personality, if you ask me. And, and, and I want to suggest to you that that peculiar personality has been given for this purpose by God because he too is to mirror the son who, according to Isaiah, in chapter 53, he says this. I'm looking for Isaiah. Oh, Isaiah, where are you? If somebody finds him, please call him this way. He says this. In, in chapter 53 and verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. This is a messianic text. Isaiah is writing about the coming Messiah. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. So he mirrors the personality of Christ in years to come. If, although it's supposed to be very unlikely that a boy like this would behave that way. But in the prefiguring, Isaac takes on that personality, does not protest, lets the father go ahead and literally put him on the altar as the silent lamb who is about to be slaughtered. For sins that he hasn't committed, because at this point he's quite innocent. So then, uh, he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught up by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Instead of his son. That's the point of the substitutionary atonement, where one dies so that another may be set free. Jesus prefigured this. Um, I mean, was prefigured here by, by Isaac and the ram. And, and therefore, Abraham becomes vindicated when he says prophetically, the Lord will provide himself the lamb of burnt sacrifice. In years to come, John the Baptist would identify this lamb of God. When he saw Jesus Christ coming during the baptism, he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. So God had provided, he would provide for himself a Lamb of sacrifice. And the Lamb of sacrifice had to be without blemish, a perfect Lamb of God, who alone was capable of taking away sin. And so when Christ climbed on that cross on that day of Good Friday, it was not for his own sin, it was for our sin. That's why we call it a substitutionary atonement. He went to appease God instead of us. 
And because our sins were laid on him, God's full wrath was unleashed on his son. And therefore, God dealt with our sin in that way. And that's what it means when it says we were justified by his death. Justification is a legal term. It means that a court had sat and, and all evidence about what we had done was brought before the, the court. And indeed, given the body of evidence available, we were pronounced guilty as charged, deserving of death. And when we were about to be killed, then the Lamb of God said, hey, don't touch them. Don't touch them. Just like he had said from above, Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy. We are the Isaacs. Don't lay a hand on him. I will pay for their sin. I will pay for their sin. And so Christ pays for our sin. So that now we are counted innocent, not because we are guiltless, but the guilt has been removed because it has been paid for fully by another. So when that has been paid for, there is no charge against us. Everything that we were charged for has been paid by another. And so Christ takes our place, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So now we can approach God with confidence. And receive help and mercy in our time of need. Because God no longer sees us as guilty. And all Christ's righteousness that he had lived here, a sinless life, is taken by God, imputed on us as though we are the ones who had lived that way. And therefore God looks at us and says, innocent, innocent, innocent. Because we have come to trust in the sacrifice of of Christ on the cross. So we are charged and, and, and viewed as innocent. Incredible, if you ask me, incredible that God could do that for us. God is so impressed that Abraham was not going to withhold his son Isaac. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. Sorry, let me back up. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught up by its horns. He went over and took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And so Christ is that provision. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand in the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. That's the value of obedience. It, it buys you what money cannot buy. And God swears by himself so that it is impossible to revoke the benefits of this Abrahamic sacrifice. I think uh, many of us are familiar with uh, what we call the hall of faith in um, Hebrews 11, it, it's one that, that speaks the name of Abraham often. And it's good to hear this sacrifice repeated in the New Testament because it's not lost its relevance. In, in chapter 11 and verse 8, by faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. So this is the amazing thing about Abraham. Without a body of evidence of how God deals with those who follow him, he still obeyed God. And that's why the Bible says he obeyed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. His act was that it made him right with God. And, and the very explanation of faith, it is the ability to, to believe, to see the things that, that are not as though they were. It's the, it's the substance of things that we hope for. So even without the evidence of it, without holding anything, you still believe God because he said so. 
God is very impressed with that kind of faith. So, even though he did not know where he was going, by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, uh, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of that promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. In other words, he never quite received in a tangible way what he was hoping for. And yet that did not deter him from following God and having confidence that God is able to fulfill his promise. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man and him as good as dead came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand in the seashore. Again, God creates things that are not as though. He calls the things that are not as though they were. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them at a distance or in, in advance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of a country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And that goes for us too. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, <coughs> excuse me, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So you give up Isaac, then you give up everything. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. <clears throat> so he's an amazing mind. Even at that time, God had never tell, told him anything about resurrection. He had never said that he's the God of the living uh, he's not the God of the dead. Those are things that are said later. But he had reason that God who enabled me to conceive Isaac and, you know, at, at a time when very elderly, he's able to raise him from the dead. So I'll give him, I'll give him that. So this text connects very well with the whole idea behind resurrection. And, and, and resurrection was prefigured in Isaac when he was received from the dead by his parents. So that today we have a solid body of evidence that this God who had this plan way ahead of time finally would raise his own son from the dead to give us the confidence that there is a future. This one who has come up with a solution to the greatest enemy of mankind. The problem of death has been solved and it was solved by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you ever visit Israel, one of the things when you go to the tomb, the supposed place where Christ was actually buried. They don't know the exact location, but there's a location near Gethsemane, somewhere there. The words that strike you at that tomb is that he is not here. He is risen. It's very powerful. And you enter there, and you take a while to just drink it in, that he did conquer death. And what's more, he promises the same to everybody who believes in him. Reminding us again that God does not hold our sin against us because Christ paid it in full. And that God was able to accept that sacrifice. When he said, Tetelestai, it is finished. It also means paid in full. Atuna deni. And therefore, when you approach the throne of God, you do so with confidence, knowing that this God has forgiven us. He has accepted us. We belong. We are part of the family. What a precious gift to be reminded of in this day of resurrection. And if, if you have never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, look at how you have shortchanged yourself. Look at the price and the horrible cost that Christ has paid for your redemption, for your salvation, for your justification. The Bible asks us, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? A debt that you can never pay 
even if you wanted to. Even if God were to slay you, even if you were to die like Isaac, if he had died on the altar, that blood shed on that altar would have been insufficient to justify him. Because God requires a perfect sacrifice and only Jesus is able to give that perfect sacrifices, sacrifice because he was a, a blameless lamb. He had no sin. Even at the time that he was unjustly treated, he uttered not a word. There was no deceit found in his mouth. And so God was able to fully accept his sacrifice so that today, those who do not have the protection of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, then you're doomed forever. You have no hope in this world. And even after this world, you have no hope but condemnation and separation from God for all time. You accept Christ as Lord and Savior for yourself. Even if you have to make a selfish decision for your own personal survival, do it. Because nobody escapes. When he comes back, he says he will not come back as a sacrifice, but he will come back to bring salvation to those who are waiting for it. He returns as king of kings and lord of lords. He returns as judge over all humanity. But he offers a hand today to you to accept him as Lord and Savior, so that on that day, when the judgment is read and when the books are opened, when your name is mentioned, somebody can stand up and pronounce, this one has been justified. This one is mine. This one is innocent. This one has no charges. All sins have been paid for in full by the cross of Jesus Christ. May God give you the courage to make the right decision. This is not one of the decisions you play around. You don't play around with your eternity. It's a terribly long time to live without God. This is a decision that you make for yourself so that you may live. Because that's what your God wants. He says, so that in the end, it may go well with you. Nobody escapes this judgment. Because when we lay you to rest, we say that the body must go back to the dust it came from and the spirit to God who gave it. You want him to receive you as your friend and not as your judge. May God give you courage to make the right decision when that time comes. People of God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And during this day as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ Jesus, may you contemplate deeply the implications of this teaching. May you contemplate deeply and take seriously the gift of God that is offered to you free of charge, but at a horrible cost to himself. May the Lord give you courage and wisdom to say yes to Jesus and to walk with him in the light of his grace every single day, knowing that you have been released from the penalty of sin, but also rescued from the power of sin so that today you can choose to live a righteous life. You can choose to do what is right because sin shall no longer be your master. Jesus Christ died to sin once and for all so that you and I could become the righteousness of God. We can choose to be right with God. We can choose to do what is right. Sin shall not be our master. Our Father, we thank you for the truths of your gospel. We thank you for the things that you have done. We thank you for how long this story has been in writing. From the days of Abraham, you began to show what you intend to do with humanity. You gave us a glimpse of glory way ahead of time. And today, with Vision 2020, we can look back and see the great work that you have set in place so that we can be saved, so that we can be free. I pray for this, your children, that you love dearly, as dearly as Abraham loved Isaac, as dearly as you love your son, Jesus Christ. I pray for them. 
that none shall be lost. That you will rescue us from our sin. You'd rescue us from our rebellion. You, you'd rescue us from our hard-heartedness. That you'd soften our hearts. And allow us that, Lord, all the barriers and the walls of pride and everything else that hinders us from coming to you would be broken down. That we'd rush to you because you're waiting to embrace us and call us your very own. We thank you and we honor you for what you have done. May your name be glorified, may it be exalted, may it be magnified. From the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, may it be known that your name is great. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.